Well, we are back in the studio, not really, but we're virtual for Market Unscripted today. And my guest is Jerry Schrader, who is the president and CEO of Encompass Agency. And we've done some work over the years, and uh, he's a great agency partner. And I'm just real glad that you got some time to spend with me today. So welcome, Jerry. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So for those out there that don't know who you are and, and what Encompass Agency does, why don't you share a little bit, please? Yeah, sure. So um, Encompass Advertising Agency is a digital marketing agency. And um, you know, I, I, of course, think we're, we're the best. No one does it better than we do. Uh, but, you know, we've we've won international awards for our work. Um, I think we're going on 200. Uh, we just won the Inc. Top Workplaces Award this year. Uh, I think out of 4,000 or so companies that applied, only about 10% of them got it. So really excited about that. And we do digital marketing. Anything that has to do with digital marketing is our wheelhouse. And um, we're just really passionate about it. You know, the... Uh, I think the awards and everything that we have come from the passion that our team shows and my passion, you always want to share your background. I don't, I don't want to get into the, the boring background of Jerry Schrader, but I will tell you a, a little bit about where my passion started, or at least where I remember it starting. And that was a, uh, a junior year in high school that one of my really good friends, one of my best friends decided he wanted to be the student body president. Remember those days? Yeah. And um, he, we were juniors. So the student body president was usually a, a senior, right? Like we didn't have much of a chance. And then it, it got really bad when we found out that his competition was going to be a very popular, very attractive young woman. <laughs> and uh, he was, he was kind of beside himself. I said, you know what? I, I'm going to help you. I'm going to be your campaign manager. Right. And, um, we were doing really good. Like he, we, he was a junior and she was more popular than him, but you know, we were doing all the banners and the posters and I was just doing everything I could to help my buddy. And, um, in the official polls, which were you know, me and a couple other people walking around going, who are you voting for? In the official polls, we were doing pretty good. But about a week before she pulled out the ultimate marketing political tactic, she went and bought everybody's votes. She handed out these lollipops to everyone in the high school. I don't know where she got her marketing budget, you know, as a senior <laughs> in high school, but we didn't have that kind of the, the funds. And um, they weren't the crappy ones either. They weren't the dum-dums. You know, they were the, the Tootsie Pops and the Blow Pops with the good stuff in the middle. I remember those. And so we were done for, you know, we, our polling showed we were, we were out. <laughs> and um, about two days before the election, a friend of mine and I wrote um, a rap. And so we decided that when they were going to go up and give their speeches, we would start my pal's speech with a rap. I'm not going to do the rap. That's not, that's not part of the story, <laughs> but um, so I'm up there and I'm rapping my other friends beatboxing. We had, we had it all going on, man. And uh, the opening line was something like uh, don't vote for someone just because they're good looking vote for I'm going to call him Brian, Brian, because he knows what he's doing. And we ended the rap on don't fall for a sucker, <laughs> vote for Brian. I love and it. that became like the slogan for the next 48 hours in the, in the, the, the battle back and forth. That's awesome. And we ended up winning this election. And I remember just how elated my friend was to, to overcome this huge hurdle and to be a part of that. And it was really at that moment in my life, I realized this is what I want to do. I mean, I, I, I just have a passion for, for marketing, but more so I got a passion for helping other people achieve what they're looking to achieve. Uh, and so that's what really makes Encompass great and my team great is we all have that passion, not just about marketing, but about really helping other people achieve what they're trying to do. Wow, that's amazing! It, it, you could almost went into uh, campaign management or PR. It seemed like with with uh, what <laughs> you were putting forth back then. Um, I want to get into for a second. You know, we met through uh, our friend Brent, who's in uh, yeah. design and development uh, on the website of things. And um, you know, we talk all the time, and it's like you know, there's big big agencies like HMH, and um, you know, the big ones out there that we know. And then it seems like there's 
everybody that thinks they're a social media expert or a digital marketing expert expert or there's one guy that you know can build a a website on WordPress and now he's you know charging clients or customers to do that and I just find there's there to be such a big gap between the person that thinks they know what they're doing and and those that do so um I'm curious like how you've built your firm obviously over mm-hmm. results and I'm impressed you're at the lake here and you have a team of how many now? We have a dozen. Yeah. And, and you're holding strong with, with all things that are going on, which we'll get into in a second. But um, when you're hiring and you're advancing and you're growing your team, how do you identify the right talent? Because in addition, and I'll plug you guys for a second, since I know your team, you have excellent tenure. Um, yeah. So you're able to not only attract the right talent, but you're able to retain them, which is a whole other challenge in itself. So when you're identifying talent for your team, um, how do you, what are some things that other owners should look at to quickly identify the pretenders mm-hmm. from the real players? Yeah. Well, you know, you, you had a lot of, of, of good points in there and I started at those big agencies and I worked for BBDO for 12 years. Um, so I had a lot of, of, um, background outside of digital. Cause back then there was no digital. I'm older than I look. Uh, but in 2006, when I started Encompass, digital was just starting to become a, a thing and the big companies weren't steering that ship very quickly. Uh, and today there are a ton of people out there who say they're digital experts. And unfortunately, a lot of companies will fall into that trap. And when we're looking for talent, uh, we, we have a couple of things. Uh, we, we follow the, the EOS uh, entrepreneurial operating system um, as far as hiring and, and firing and making sure the right people are in the right seats. And I think that has really helped us stay strong. Uh, but we also, we, we use something called the, um, the CVI test and it helps identify, it's one of those assessment tests, but what's really cool is it takes about 10 minutes and it helps identify what people's motivations are and what's going to fulfill them. So it, it breaks it out into four different quadrants and you make a blueprint for each job that you're trying to hire for. And what we have found is that if we can get somebody to take the assessment and fit that blueprint, almost, oh, I'd say nine out of 10 times, that person is not only going to be able to do the job, but they catch on quicker. Um, they stay around longer because they're fulfilled at what they're doing. And it's been a great tool for us to make sure that we get people who um, really are in the right seat. Cause we're, we're, we just got done putting out a, a job um, posting recently. And uh, what was interesting to me is we get a lot of people applying for a digital media specialist job who is number crunching, analyzing data. They're in front of their computer all day long and then when we get back to the assessment, a ton of people who are taking it are like, they're, they're called merchants in this um, assessment, but I would compare that to, to more of a type A type of person in another assessment, a very extrovert. So they got these huge extroverts. They love being around people and yet they really want to be a digital media specialist. It's like, you're going to hate this job. Right. So it's really just as much about making sure that that person is going to be fulfilled as it is about making sure that the company finds somebody who can do that, that duty on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, that's a great point. You actually reminded me when I had a uh, search firm 20 years ago, and we all know interviewing is like dating, basically. Everybody's on their best behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, there's some very talented people that can interview well. And what, what, what do we tend to do? We go with people that we think are similar to us, or we like their energy, but those assessments dig into where you can't really get to the bottom of it. They really can show, you know, if this person's a fit or not. So I'm I'm glad to hear you do that. And I think for a lot of the owners out there, especially in the Lake area and Charlotte area, I'd be surprised if even half of them use an an assessment. Uh, I would be surprised. One of the cool things about that assessment is they actually give you questions that you can ask people. So like if they're on the fence or they're, you know, a little high in one number or the other, and these questions, uh, are they're like insight into your soul. Like after people <laughs> are working here for a while, they'll tell me, man, those interview questions you asked, those, those were so hard because they're not really asking the basic questions. You're sure. really putting them in a situation that they have to think about who they are in order to answer them. Yeah. So you get a lot more honest answers, whether someone's a good interview or not. 
Yeah. And then, you know, it, it like you, it digs into behavioral based and mm-hmm. problem solving on the spot, not just pat answers. But what I also found to be helpful in those assessments, and we use them too, is that there's some somewhat of a, a BS factor in there. It can tell if somebody is just blowing smoke by their right. answer. It can tell if there's validity or integrity in the answer. So that's also very, very helpful. Yep. Um, so what's, let's talk about, uh, you know, it's, it's June, 2020. It's been a very interesting year so far. Um, you know, interesting of the year. yeah, to be honest, you know, a lot of my clients are struggling uh, in some areas. They're, they're trying to make payroll. They're trying to, you know, cover their basic operating expenses. Yeah. So marketing is, you know, somewhat on the, on the lower end of the priorities, if you will, right now. And in what I, what we do specialty marketing, obviously with, with the video and the photography side of things, but what are you seeing out there? Um, good and bad with, with clients in marketing? Man, great question. Um, I always go back to, I believe it was a quote by Henry Ford uh, that says, you cutting advertising to save money is like stopping your watch to save time. It just doesn't work. And what I've seen through this, and I think the statistics actually show that uh, for local businesses, about 50% of them during this crisis have cut or stopped all their advertising. And about 44% have increased or maintained their advertising. And you got to ask yourself, what do those 44% know that the rest of the, of us, the rest of the people out there don't know? And what they know is history. When you look at companies like Kellogg's who marketed through a recession and came out and they were behind post cereal post stopped their advertising during the, the great uh, depression. Uh, Kellogg's did not Kellogg's came out gaining market share and riding that wave for decades. Right. Uh, you look at GM after nine 11, they did the same thing. And when you look at different companies and what they've been able to do through crises, it was the ones that kept their marketing going that gained market share came out of the crisis faster on the other side. And so we've seen this with our clients uh, as well. And there's a reason for it. Um, I sent you over a slide that you can, you can throw up, but there is the data from what has been happening during this specific crisis of coronavirus. And what's really interesting is there's this baseline of media usage and ad spending. So how much uh, media is consumed and how much advertising is being spent. And you'll notice that when COVID hit right around the end of March, there's this huge increase, about 60% growth of media consumption, which is insane. Everyone's at home. They have nothing to do. So this media consumption has grown on just about every channel, whether it's television or digital or you name it, media consumptions grow. But advertisers have cut by 40%. So it's created this huge bubble of opportunity where you have a larger audience and you have much less ad clutter. That's how you gain market share. So what we're trying to share with all of our clients is right now, before everyone else jumps back in the market, right now is a time to to turn back your advertising on if you had to cut or increase it if you had to cut back, because right now is where you're going to be able to take advantage of that opportunity. If you wait too long, your recovery is going to be a lot slower. Um, I know that's not, not everyone's able to do it because you said some people are are dealing with payroll issues. Um, Some people are still waiting for the PPP uh, loans to figure out if they're going to be forgiven. And uh, I think some are still even waiting to get approved. Um, So not everyone can do it, but if you can, now is the time to turn that back on. And we've seen that I've got, uh, when this whole thing started, we were really following this closely and we had three clients, six clients, same industry, same market size, um, same situation across the country. And three of them were saying, now we got to cancel. And the other three were saying, we're going to leave things where they're at. And so we were like, Ooh, good data. We're going to be able to see how these compare. Sure enough, the three that cut saw a significant decrease in their web traffic and their leads, and they're still struggling to get going even after states are starting to reopen. The three that kept their advertising going 
we had one of them that not only maintained their leads, but they increased a hundred percent on their pay-per-click campaign leads. Wow. Cause everyone else in the market was, was turning off their ads. So we've got some really good data for our clients showing them, Hey, that this is, this is true. This chart is playing out before our eyes. Let's get back in there and get aggressive with our advertising, not, not be shy about getting back in there quickly. Great stuff. I got some follow for you, but we got to take a quick commercial break. So we'll be right back after these words. Hey, aren't you a business owner? Yeah, you need to get a video from 360 Visuals. It's the best way to drive business to your website. Well, I prefer to do business the old fashioned way. Oh, I just set up two new meetings. Uh, I don't know. You know what they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 360 Visuals, videos that keep up with the times. Okay, we're back with Jerry Schrader again. Um, diving into ad spend and why you should market, why you should advertise now. Really good stuff. Jerry, I want to get into more specifics with this um, as far as content, specific content. What's working now? What should people not do when it comes to creating content for ads? Well, you know, content is is tricky right now, um, especially when it comes to what you're doing. I mean, you're, you're, you're living in the video world. You create great content. The trick is really where you're going to show that content. I mean, that's the side of the equation that we work with. And one of the, the topics that was really hot before COVID hit and is now starting to resurface is the question of um, where to put my video content. And a lot of places are trying to get you to put it all in what's called OTT or connected TV, uh, which is a, it's a really good medium. It's growing at a huge rate but the conversations are a little dishonest out there. So I, I, I spend a lot of time trying to train my clients on this. So I think it's good for all local business owners and, and national, uh, we, we work with national accounts too. It, it's good for everybody to know. And that's that the people who are pushing connected TV and OTT are excited about it because of the growth. And if you look, I think the number that came out recently was that they're expecting a 55% growth rate globally for connected TV from 2019 to 2020. If you don't know what OTT and connected TV are, to make it simple, OTT stands for over the top. And it comes from a box that you usually put over your TV or under your TV, like a Roku or an Apple TV. So it's referring to streaming sh shows that you watch on a box that's connected to your TV. So that thus it's called connected TV or OTT. We in the digital marketing world love to like make up terms and then <laughs> confuse everybody because we change what it means from an, on a daily basis. But OTT is a great property, but the problem with some of the numbers that are being thrown out there are that that growth rate is huge. But what they don't tell you is that almost all of that growth rate is coming from two channels that you can't advertise on. Mm. That's Netflix <laughs> and Disney Plus. They've grown exponentially, especially during the COVID crisis, but you cannot buy an ad on there. So the companies that are saying, hey, let's move all of your, your broadcast TV and throw it into OTT are going to take a tactic that is meant to get in front of a broad reach audience and it's going to put it into this little tiny audience. So your frequency is going to be through the roof, but your reach is going to be really bad. So you got to be careful to not move it all over. So I'm a proponent of having a lot of different tactics working for you at the same time. What we do for our clients is OTT is a good medium, but digital video and taking your TV spots and moving them over to pre-roll, mid-roll, um, YouTube, we'll put about 10 to 20% in OTT. The other 80% is gonna be in those others, the YouTube um, and the pre-rolls and the mid-rolls. And during this year, there's a reason everyone's talking about that shift. It's because of the elections. You know, it's an election year, huge election year, and um, you're gonna get preempted. Stations are already talking about getting preempted. So you wanna make sure your message is out there and you, you gotta do that by playing a little bit with your media mix. Uh, so definitely move it around. Just don't throw all of it into that OTT bucket without uh, knowing exactly what you're getting for it. Yeah, imagine you had an ad running when Tiger King was uh, was airing 
all across the country. Mm-hmm. That would have been amazing. Everybody would have seen it in the world. <laughs> but good point. That was that was Netflix. Right. So yep. There were no ads. Right. So you could run an ad against it. Yeah. So that's a good point. So the advice is don't put all your chips in one pile or one basket. Um, we're talking video, obviously, my my passion. Right. Um, so just let's go back to basics for a second. You know, you have a a we'll just use Facebook for example. Um, you have a still image ad, mm-hmm. you have a text ad, and then you have a video ad. Talk about in your background and understanding of of reach and conversions and engagement when you when you just take those three separately. Yeah, you are always going to get a better response if you if you can create a video for it. Um, you know, not to push your side of the house too heavy, but uh, videos. You know, you get you get moving pictures and sound and all of that instead of just a static image. So it it, it captures people. Um, they'll actually watch a video for a little bit. It, it's got to be really good out of the gate. If you don't capture their attention in the first few seconds, they're gone. Right. Um, but when you look at all the statistics from campaigns that we run, uh, the video ads definitely get more traction. And on social media, I think it's important to say this because I am still amazed at how many people um, are using an old school social media mentality. Mm -hmm. Posting on your business page on social media is not going to be seen by very many people. And boosting that post is going to help get it seen. But when you boost it, you don't have near the targeting options as if you were to buy an ad and run that ad in Facebook's ad manager. Right. Uh, so if, if you have a great video that you really want to get out in front of people and you want to get in front of the right segment, get into Facebook ad manager or find someone who can help you and uh, do it that way. Don't, don't go back to the, Oh, I'll just post it and I'll boost my post and I'll expect that I'll get a good uh, return on investment out of those dollars. Yeah. Great, great tip. Because I think initially that's what we all did. That's what we learned. And then, they yeah. evolved it and got better and better targeting, as you said. And I don't, I don't think a lot of people know that you can actually target via an email list. If you have your own email list, that's clean. You can target that way, uh, target so many different ways. Um, yeah. I was going to ask you um, with just something on uh, with video, one final question with what you're seeing, because I know a lot of your clients are B2C and mm-hmm. I believe you have some B2B where it's primarily, we yeah, we're, we're B2B exclusively. So I wanted to ask you, um, with YouTube now, for organic SEO, um, you know, obviously, you know, when we advise clients on a brand video, not a 30-second TV ad or a 60-second TV ad, it's, you know, we always encourage people to stay in that 90 to 120-second window because if it's done correctly, that's about the right duration to get a lot of things across and keep it exciting and moving. When you move into the 5, 10-minute video, people just don't have the attention span to stay with it. Having said right. that, what I'm seeing now is the way YouTube is uh, ranking or measuring success of videos isn't by the number of views, but it's the duration of how long the video is watched. Um, they're positioning uh, you better SEO wise if your video is watched longer. For example, if you have a 90 second video and 100 people watch it, it's better if you had a 10 minute video and 20 people watch it, but they watched six minutes of the 10 minutes, for example. Are you, are you, what are you advising your clients when it comes to YouTube specifically in, in terms mm-hmm. of longer form? Yeah, we don't have a lot of clients that have 10 minute content. Sure. Um, you know, if you've got a podcast like this, or you've got something that you can do 10 minutes worth of, of content on, um, then you should do it. But I also think you should have a mixture mm-hmm. of shorter content so that you've got little blasts and then right. big blasts and one should promote the other. And when it comes to, paying for those ads on YouTube, uh, you can make sure that that ad shows up in front of the right people. I mean, you know, you talk about uh, different industries like plumbers, for instance, we can take a plumbing video ad and show it to people who have watched ads on how to clean my drain. So like people who are at home trying to figure this out and all of a sudden that before they click on their next do it yourself video, it's like, Hey, right. $99 will come on clean your drain for you. Uh, so, YouTube is really targeted. And one of the other things that YouTube has is what they call their bumper ads. And what they did a study on, and we've seen it uh, really go right along with the statistics that they were showing, is if you've got like a a 90 second or a 60 second ad, and you cut one of these six second bumper ads, 
and you run six second bumper ads along with your 90 second ad, you see about a 35% lift in brand recognition. Uh, so those two combined have really helped our clients get that brand lift boost that we we're looking for. Awesome. Good stuff. So I just want to uh, wrap up as we're getting close here to, you know, what, um, any other advice you can offer out there from the marketing side of things in, you know, in addition to what you're saying, um, and related to just the situation that we're all in, you know, what are, what are some safe things? Let's say you have little to no budget right now. Um, but you know, you have time and you have, you know, sweat equity. What can you do as a business owner to mm -hmm. weather the storm, to keep, you know, maybe organic moving correctly, um, those kind of things. What advice can you offer business owners out there? Biggest piece of advice is what I was talking about earlier. Don't be afraid to be aggressive. Um, spend the money now. It's, it's the time where your competition is afraid to. So get in there and, and do your thing. Uh, but even with small budgets, you know, social media and pay-per-click are two places that you can really target your message. Uh, pay-per-click's more of that bottom of the funnel it's when customers are ready to buy. So that's, if you need to turn something around quickly, a good solid pay-per-click campaign is a perfect place to start. And then social media is very inexpensive. Again, just use the Facebook ad manager tool more than you use the boosted posts because you can target so much better. Uh, and then the last thing I would end on is I, I have sensed from some of my clients uh, and other people I've talked to is there's a little bit of apprehension to jump back in with an ad message for fear of um, being tone deaf, like to the, to the, the world around us. And I just don't know if now's the time that I should be selling that hard. Right. And I, I always go back to uh, author and, and CEO, Michael Hyatt's quote, and he said, marketing is simply sharing your passion with others. That's all you're doing. You've got a pa every business owner I know is passionate about what they're doing. They didn't start that business just because they thought they could make some money. They, they, they started it because they were passionate about selling cars or about automobiles or about their hair salon or their uh, heating and cooling. I mean, they, they're passionate about what they do. Marketing is just sharing that passion with others. And right now people need some passion. So don't be afraid to do it and um, make sure that your when you drive, everything goes to your website, make sure your website's up to date and make sure right now your website says, we're open if you're open because uh, that's not to be assumed at this point in time. Great stuff, Jerry. Always, always appreciate chatting with you. Very insightful. Best way for someone to uh, reach out to you guys if they have some digital marketing needs? Yeah, encompassagency.com. That's the best way to reach us. Uh, E-N-C-O-M-P-A-S-S -S agency. So it's E-N, not encompass, but encompassagency.com. Thanks a bunch, Jerry. Thanks for having me.